Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Optimus Process Solutions webinar series. Um, this series, we will be talking about dryer theory, airflow, and combustion. Uh, my name is Tom Zhang, and I'll be the host today. And uh, today we have uh, our guest speaker, Hank Lawson, from uh, Louisville Dryer Group. Um, before we start, just some rules of the webinar. If you guys encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please call us at 877-316-6140 or 502-244-4031 and say webinar issues. If you get disconnected, please go to www.gotowebinar.com and click, click um, join a webinar. The webinar ID for this session is 108 499-763. We do encourage questions, however, all your microphones are muted right now, and once we finish the webinar um, slides, please type in the questions in your box, and we will answer as many questions as we have time to. Um, we will also be recording this session, and it will be uploaded to the YouTube channel, and it will be sent out uh, sometime next week. So first off, our guest speaker, Hank Lawson, is a, he is the senior process engineer for Louisville Dry Group. He's got a bachelor's in chemical engineering from JB Speed School of Engineering at University of Louisville. He's got over 30 years of experience in process engineering and all facets of other types of uh, manufacturing work. He's got professional experiences in industrial fans, air pollution controls, hammer mills and pellet mills, rotary, dryer, steam tubes, you name it multiple holder of uh, patents on different processes. Without further ado, I'll let you introduce uh, Hank Lawson. Uh, well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, we're going to talk about um, about dryers and uh, all types of dryers. Um, a little bit of an introduction about Louisville Dryer. We are about a 120-year-old company, uh, started uh, in the manufacture of steam tube dryers. Uh, we also uh, have, have spread over uh, the last several years, probably 60 years ago, into the manufacture of direct heat dryers, high temperature indirect heat dryers, refractory lined kilns, uh, rotary coolers, both air and indirect type. That would be a water tube type um, and uh, rotary mixers and rotary quenchers and basically any process equipment that, uh, that rotates on uh, riding rings and trunnions, which we'll discuss a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the very first uh, slide that we have on dryers, uh, we're, we're illustrating steam tube dryers here. Uh, the top right dryer is a, is a pretty common type of steam tube dryer that might be used in, uh, in corn wet milling or in uh, processing. Uh, it'd be a little bit large, typically for the DDG of, of distilleries, but not ethanol plants. Um, inorganic materials. That are that are processed that have a, a sensitivity to, to temperature. Uh, the one below is a is a dryer that's manufactured in the petrochemical industry where it has special seals on it. Both those dryers are typically a rotating tube and shell heat exchanger, uh, and they use uh, steam that can be from 100 psi to 400 psi uh, in their and uh, they're an indirect type dryer. Um, <clears throat> the second group of dryers that we're showing right now is a direct heat type where we're bringing hot gases into the, uh, into the dryer. We're rotating and, and bailing materials uh, by lifting flights and we allow that air to impart its, its heat load into the product where it uh, heats and volatilizes the water and then uh, the water leaves and then dry product comes out the end of the dryer. So in this one you got a um you got a combustion chamber over here. Um, yeah. Can you expand a little bit more? Yeah. We have uh, this portion right here. We have mm -hmm. a combustion chamber on this dryer. Uh, this dryer, we have a burner that's bringing the combustion gases into this mixing chamber or combustion chamber. We have a portion uh, where we're allowing air. We're actually force drafting air to come in uh, to move around a, a, a thimble there mm. and then mix with after combustion it mixes with the hot gases and so that we can bring the air temperature that we want into into this dryer that would be uh, lowered uh, that particular dryer 
was both um, inorganic and organic materials mixed and we had to temper the air on account of the organic materials. Um, this up here is a very low temperature dryer. It actually uses steam coils as the heating source and we bring the air through the steam coils. Uh, that was on an, uh, drying polymers. Interesting. Okay. So this is just a better view of the combustion this, chamber? This is a better view of a of combustion chamber, um, loosely termed combustion chamber or air heater. Mm -hmm. And you have your you have your burner at one end of this and, and on the other end we have a process air fan that's bringing the gases in that will cool those uh, combustion gases. So if you're combusting air at uh, say 30 percent excess air and you're running at uh, 2950 or 3000 degrees, you want the air coming into the dryer, it would be attached right here, then you can run this fan on a variable frequency drive to bring in whatever air you need to uh, to make that those hot gases whatever temperature you need coming mm. into the dryer. So that so that fan is there to control the, the temperature coming out. That's correct. The the, the burner is uh, it it is the it manages the heat load based on how much work has to be accomplished in the dryer mm. and this fan here uh, is there to produce the temperature of the gases you need. So, interesting. Um, this is a high temperature indirect heat dryer. The uh, the first dryers that we talked about, the steam tube dryer, is is um, it's an indirect heat dryer utilizing um, uh, both radiant and conductive heat. Um, the direct heat dryers are more of a convective heat dryer, and this is pretty much a radiant heat dryer. We have a we have the rotating cylinder going through the combustion chamber and uh, there are burners on the opposite side. They're actually heating refractory inside this combustion chamber. That refractory is radiated its heat through the shell and and then the shell imparts its heat uh, conductively through and into the product. Uh, this is done when you have a very fine material that you can't have high gas velocities coming through the dryer or material that the get that the combustion gases might uh, uh, might react with, uh, or and uh, they're used a lot in uh, um, in paints and pigments, or pigments for paints, mm. in carbon black and in uh, regenerating catalysts. Is there a reaction? You know, sometimes there can be a reaction on this. This this can be termed uh, this. A lot of people term this. We call it a high temperature indirect heat dryer. Mm. Uh, a lot of customers may call it a kiln. Some people may call it a calcine or depending on what it's going on inside it. Calcine is when you're looking, calcine typically is, is a term used for driving off molecularly bound water. You might have a product that has a certain free moisture in it, but there also may be water that is chemically bound to the material. That water would actually be in a crystal, a crystalline format. Mm. So if you if you break that bond and re release that water, then it will go to liquid. Then it will go to vapor. Mm, okay. So if it's a bonded water to it, so you have to heat it up to a certain temperature for it to break. Typically, out. you have to heat that higher. You'll heat it mm. higher than the boiling point of water to be able to get that to to release and right. volatilize. Okay. So a dryer is just removing moisture. Calciner is more of if it's a chemically bonded water mm. and then it removes it, and then kiln is. Uh, pretty synonymous with cow sign there a little bit. It, it, sort of, or uh, some other chemical reaction that's going on, so oxidation or mm -hmm. some sort of water. Right. Okay. This is the opposite side of that dryer where you see the burners that are burning and uh, the top has been, it has not been placed on this one yet, but uh, you have burners and they are burning in zones. This is one burner that's in a zone. You have two burners here in a zone, then two more burners, and then we have a three zone, a three burner zone there. And then one, I believe that piece of equipment had nine burners on it. They have a common header for their combustion gases, but each burner can operate independent of the, uh, of, of each set of burners can operate independent. So these three burners operate as one, these two operate as one, and these two operate as one. So we're monitoring the temperature of the shell, and we're firing uh, the burners uh, up or down, depending on the need to keep that shell at a certain temperature. Um, right here we're looking at a, uh, this would be a direct fire unit, but it has a refractory lining in a portion of the shell. Uh, we sometimes uh, uh, will refractory line the entire shell or, or a portion thereof, uh, depending on what's going on inside that piece of equipment. So that too was a 
was um, done for a, a special reaction. Mm. So um, I guess we all know from a, from being a child what drying is. You put clothes in a in a dryer and they come out. They go in wet. They come out dry. But need to go back and break it down into its simplest definition. Drying is the separation of a liquid from a solid, typically utilizing a thermal energy to volatilize the liquid and allowing it to leave as a vapor. So it's really a, a separation technique. Um, and uh, so we'll have, we'll have solids that are being fed into a dryer. We'll have our heat source, uh, and that that would be true for any of the dryers that we've discussed. And then we will have an exhaust fan, which is pulling out the vapor. That vapor most likely will contain some air and some of the liquid vapor. And then your solids go down into the continuing process or storage or wherever they're going. So. And the heat source is just mainly there for all the different types of heat. Right? That heat source could be steam. It could be hot gases. Mm -hmm. uh, or it could be radiant heat being delivered uh, from, from a refractory source. Um, here, now we're specifically talking about a convective type dryer where we're bringing warm air into a dryer, then we're going to heat and evaporate off the water vapor and then and then they're going to leave, the green represents the air and water uh, leaving in partnership with one another. So we have a dryer that has warm air in it. And if you make that air, it says moderately warm air, but if you heat that air a little, a little more, then you get a little more water vapor. Um, and you get a little bit more exhaust. Uh, actually, probably a little, maybe not more exhaust. If, if you heat it even hotter, then you get a greater quantity of water vapor and, and your air and water vapor. What this is signifying is the hotter that you can make your air in conjunction with the material, the fewer number of pounds of hot gas that you need going into the dryer. That affects the size of the dryer and or the amount of production that you're able to perform. So, so it, it benefits you economically to make the air as hot as you can. Mm. And uh, I would... Uh, quantify right now that that we use the term hot air um, because the hot combustion gases typically mixed with air um, they have about the same relationship as air so so we use that word interchangeably uh, it, it more appropriately would be called a hot air hot gas hot gas, hot gas. Uh, so now our exhaust um, in drying, the, the air or hot gas is at the heart of the drying process, and this is the focal point of the entire pr uh, plant. And it controls your production or the lack thereof. What we mean by that is that the uh, um, people tend to think in terms of, I'm going to step out of, out of the text here for just a bit, but they think of their dryer in terms of how many tons can I put through this dryer, okay? You have to really think in terms of how much, when we're designing a dryer, how much mass of hot gas can we put through a specific size dryer? Uh, and, and so in thinking about airflow, instead of thinking about it in volume, it's better to think of it in terms of mass or pounds or kilograms, however you would uh, want to term it. Uh, so, um, this is a, a kind of a comparative sheet where we have the amount of, of drying um, related to the tonnage of output. So you might say, I've got a dryer, I want 50 tons of output, and we get calls a lot of times. Somebody may say, I've got to dry this product, and I want to dry 50 tons through it. So we ask what it is you're drying, and any particulars regarding uh, densities, uh, angle of repose, and anything we can get in, in, in that manner. But th the important question is, how much work are we going to do? So what is, uh, what is the percent moisture going in, and what would you like to see coming out? In this case, we would like to see zero. We would like for it bone dry coming out, and I've got between 5 and 10 percent moisture. Okay. So, so when we're told that, um, 
it sounds like when you're talking about 50 tons at 5 or 10 percent moisture, the difference in that is 5 percent. You're actually talking the difference between 5 and 10 percent moisture being a hundred percent of the workload. So this is more of like a psychological. It's a kind of a psychological, yeah, it's, it's sort of a psychological thing in your mind. The difference between 5 and 10 percent is 5 percent. Everybody knows that. But the amount of work that's going to be done on a 50 ton unit at 5 percent moisture, we're going to evaporate uh, 5,000 pounds of water, okay? Um, or, well, we're going to evaporate 2,500 pounds of water at 5 percent. But if we have 50 or 5 tons, 2.5 tons of water, it's 5,000. 5, if, if we're going to evaporate 10 percent, then we're going to evaporate 5 tons or 10,000 pounds. So you're doing twice as much work on a, on a dryer performing at 10 percent as you are at one doing 5 percent. We can build that dryer for any mechanical throughput. Uh, it's, it's nothing but more or less other than the veiling characteristic that's going on, the number two thing is doing is conveying material from one place to another. So whether it conveys 50 tons or 100 tons or 200 tons, it's just a matter of making the mechanical aspects of it. But the workload that's going to be done is based on how much evaporation is being done. So, so like a good way to think about it will be like instead of starting with five, ten percent, change that into a poundage, mm -hmm. and then and then kind of think through that because five percent, ten percent, you can really get screwed up if you really are using say one percent, two percent versus ten percent. That I have that changes a lot. If I say if you say five to ten percent, we would have to design for ten percent. Mm -hmm. If material is four or five percent most of the time our dryer would be twice too large mm, right so oh, another way to think about that if you think of terms you know we we think and we especially in our air pollution or bag house and that sort of thing in the air system goes with the dryer we think of it as terms of volume so how, where do we start with that well if you take one cubic foot if we have anybody out there operating hot air balloons uh, you probably know this. One cubic foot of air at sea level and 70 degrees weighs 0 0.075 pounds. So we probably have 400 pounds of air in this room right now. So um, if you state that another way, if you take a pound of air, how much volume would that would take up? It would take up about 13.3 cubic feet, again, at 70 degrees and at sea level. But if we were to heat that air to, to a nominal stack temperature coming, like it coming out of a dryer, uh, that 13.3 cubic feet of air turns into 17.85 cubic feet of air. And on a typical application, we're, we're not just going to have that air heated up going through the dryer and coming out. We're going to add some water vapor to it. So now we've changed the mass flow. The water, the air is going to be a constant it's not going to change from one end of the system to the other. It's going to be the same number of pounds, uh, barring leaks and that sort of thing. But if we add water vapor to that, and this would be like a typical adding the water vapor, we turn that, that 17 pounds into 21 pounds uh, or 21 cubic feet. So the other thing that does is it changes our, our density characteristics of the gas stream, which is critically important. Um, water vapor has about 60 percent the weight of air. Thinking of it another way, if you think of it in terms of volume, it has about 1.6 the volume per cube for pound that air, that, um, that air will have. So when you start to uh, you start to do your calculations, if you're coming out with a 20 percent uh, water vapor on poundage, 40 percent of that volume may be the water vapor. Mm. So they really need a we all really need to consider the water vapor. Uh, otherwise, it could, it screws up your, your fan selection, your air selection, all that. And note the um, green is yellow on the air and blue on the water, and it makes it green. So FYI. Thanks. So what what we were doing is is um, the way we would select the dryers, once we get all these constituents in, uh, especially a convective dryer, we're going to look at the velocity of that um, through that dryer. And that's going to dictate how much work you want to do, how much air it takes to do it, 
And we do all this before we even start to think what size this dryer has to be. And then we will, we will input um, a velocity that we want through that dryer based on the known concepts or the local knowledge of the, of the process. And we will, we will size the diameter of the dryer uh, to get the area we need for proper velocity. And you would say like a, a Q or quantity of gas equals a velocity times the area. So Q equals VA, your quantity of gas uh, and, and your, uh, is, is equivalent to the area of the dryer times the velocity. So if you have a known velocity, uh, you, you would uh, divide that into your quantity and that would give you the area of the dryer. That sets the diameter of the dryer that we're going to use. Um, thinking this another way, uh, for those of, of you out there who may be shipping by your product in, in, in trucks or, or rails or in bulk, uh, we use uh, the, symb the symbolism of truck. And that truck represents one pound of air and it's carrying a specific amount of heat in it a uh, certain number of BTUs or calories or joules and it's going to bring those into the dryer and it's going to dump those out and part those into the material where it's going to heat the material. It's going to heat the water vapor and then it's going to evaporate the water vapor. So if each truck represents one pound of air and it's hauling a specific number of BTUs, say two, three hundred, depending on how hot it is. and each truck carries out X number of pounds of water uh, plus whatever your stack loss is and maybe about 60 BTUs that you put into it you don't get out because of that stack loss. Um, what you have to decide is how many trucks you need to carry that heat load in. And that depends on how much work you're going to do and what the temperature of that gas is coming through the dryer. So the amount of work dictates the amount of hot air that is introduced into the dryer, said another way. And the work is the amount of heat that's transferred, not the number of tons produced. The tonnage is the result of the work done. So it almost sounds like air is the most important to understand. For a convective dryer, mm -hmm. the amount of work we start with the product and decide how much heat we need to do that. From there on, this becomes an air system for a convective style dryer. Mm -hmm. right. It's you can think of it in two ways. One is a material handling system, the other as an air system, mm -hmm. um, and it makes a lot of sense if you think of it in terms of, of part of the air system. Um, what can happen is uh, you may say I have gas coming out of the dryer at um, at at two say two hundred thirty degrees. And at a and at um, at a specific uh, altitude, and uh, most of the the people who would provide the fans for these systems can take that information, plug that into a typical uh, fan selection chart, and they can make a, a real nice selection and generate a curve. This illustrates where you do uh, temperature and altitude, temperature and altitude, and you don't take into consideration the correct density for air for water in the airstream. Uh, this is a corrected value for, uh, uh, for having the water vapor in. So if, if the fan is incorrectly selected, you could, you could look at uh, somewhere around uh, you know, a 10% reduction in the performance because the fan doesn't deliver the quantity of air that's required to carry enough BTUs in to do that job. Um, another thing that we would consider are uh, um, leaks. If you're trying to control your heat loads but you don't have good seals on the feed end or the discharge into that dryer, you can have a you can have a one inch uh, crack around the, the the dryer shell and and say the discharge hood where you have to and you're pulling air in there you can pull eight or ten percent of the air that that should go through that dryer through that through that leak. Now it's not going through the dryer, so it isn't doing any work. And it's cold, pulling into a hot system, so it has to be heated so that you don't uh, condense in your air pollution or your bag house or your air pollution system. So you have to have a, an excess heat coming through that dryer that you didn't use just to heat that air. Uh, 
Uh, so that that uh, that causes uh, uh, that can cause a heavy burden on a system, and you know you can lose ten or fifteen percent just on leakage. So um, uh, this is um, uh, this is a, a graph showing uh, combustion, and and it, it fits into that leakage thing. But but you take a standard combustion to be about thirty thirty six hundred uh, degrees and uh, this is excess air uh, of combustion so if you get to say 50 points of excess air uh, you're, you've already dropped your temperature 20, 26, 2700 degrees uh, dryers will, will operate in this range uh, and uh, we will introduce that excess air in there but what you don't want to do is introduce it as leakage what you want to do is you want to you want to be able to control that air coming in to quench that flame. Right. That that kind of goes back to that combustion chamber and the tramp air going mm -hmm. through. This this is kind of the same concept, but mm -hmm. this is the unwanted mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. Is is that a question? No. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let me move this over. There you go. Okay. So. Minimize leakage. Um, you do that with proper seals uh, on both the feed and the discharge end of, of the dryer. Um, you want access doors and breaching to be kept closed. Uh, on many of the dryers that uh, that we would build, we might have a tipper door where the dryer discharges into the discharge hood and it's counterweighted so no material is being discharged. Uh, it's closed. Uh, rotor valves and dump valves and auger should be in good working order and sealed. And um, and the negative pressure at the end of the dryer should be maintained uh, enough enough negative pressure for optimal operation, but not so much uh, that it you, you literally can pull unspent fuel away from a boiler uh, from a burner if you have uh, too much pressure. So uh, so you want to make sure that uh, your air system operates off the it's going to operate to maintain a proper negative pressure. So either with a damper. Or with a variable frequency drive on your exhaust fan, uh, you want to have um, the correct pressure pulling against that combustion system. Uh, we're looking at a couple of different type seals here. Um, this is actually a, uh, a graphite type seal where uh, we have a counterweight that we and a cable goes around to, to pull the, the segments in, and and they are uh, they are sliding against the shell. And then they are kept uh, pushed tight against the discharge, or the, this is actually the uh, the feed hood, um, by by these spring-loaded bolts here. Um, very common seal that's used a lot is an overlapping type uh, leaf-style seal where they're bolted in. That's a very good seal, and um, they um, uh, inexpensive to to change out relative to other other uh, to that type seal, and uh, they do a, a a decent job. It, depending on what you're doing. And seals are mainly for air, not material. That's a very good point. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a good point, Tom. The, the seals are meant to keep air from coming into the dryer. They're not necessarily meant to keep material from spilling out of the dryer. So if there's carryover or things like that, there, it needs to be looked at. If, if you have material that's getting out into that cavity between the seal and the dryer, uh, that's a that's a symptom of a of a Usually, a, a flighting issue inside that should be uh, should be addressed. Uh, depending on what we're doing, uh, we would we do uh, custom flighting on the dryers that are manufactured, and depending on what materials handling the the uh, the material handling characteristics of it, how it picks up and veils, you might want to move material through and not do much veiling until it starts to break loose, and then pick it up and 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 drop it a couple times, and then you start to pick it up and shower it in a in a constant veil all the way through the cross section of the dryer, and we'll use a varying kinds of flights in order to uh, to see that that happens. So this is a spiral flight right here to push material in before it starts working through the process, and this is just material uh, flighting section that just picks up the material to uh, that's already capable of uh, it's fluffy and and ready to veil. So and just just the shape of the flights it has a very different reasoning inside yeah you'll see sawtooth flights right here that that are they're made to they'll start to release early and and, and hold product over um 
and they're used in conjunction with like right there a J flight and, and 45s. We mix those flights up. To, the 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 attempt is to get a constant veil through both the ascending and the descending rotation of the dryer. Mm -hmm. um, you can click on that. There you go. This is basically a burner system operating, and you see see the veiling characteristic going on inside the dryer there. So, and as it you can't see it very well, but as it goes on down the dryer, it starts to veil even better. So. Wow. And. Okay. So, um, we're getting ready for questions. Um, actually, let me get that. If you guys have any questions that you would like to um, discuss with Hank or have Hank answer, feel free to um, type in your questions. Um, you know, any questions related to um, the, the theory, the airflow, combustion, feel free at this time to write on the question box mm -hmm. where the questions are, and then we will answer them when we get to them. One of the Okay, one of the questions we see right now is, Hank, how do you determine our temperature in the dryer? How do you determine that? Well, um, this is assuming we're talking about a, 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 direct a rotor direct heat dryer, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be dependent on the material. If you were handling, um, say, a, a wood or material like that, uh, you may go in at a very low temperature because that tends to give off DOCs early. Uh, and also can can catch fire. So you know you you would uh, you would typically go in you know five or six hundred degrees, and and uh, other materials you may be able to go in fourteen fifteen hundred degrees. So it's going to be dependent on uh, what the what the material can handle without degradation or or changing characteristics of it. So and is there a way to measure that? There's a way to, you can, well, that on our dryer, we would measure that temperature coming into the dryer from the combustion chamber. That That is something we would measure, uh, and, it, uh, and if you would maybe go back to that uh, the combustion chamber, uh, if you can, uh, we'll be measuring that temperature, and I, I guess, right here, there you go. We'd be measuring the temperature uh, coming out of the dryer, and that that dictates what the burner is doing. And then, uh, but the but the temperature of the gas coming into the dryer uh, is is what's going to um, operate that blue fan. And we're going we can set that at 500, 600, 800, 1,000, 1,400, whatever we want that temperature to be. Uh, that temperature is going to be based on. This is kind of goes back to local knowledge of the process for a specific application. Uh, they're not all the same, so so uh, we would go back through our process and we'd look and see what what we can, and we're going to make it as hot as we can make it uh, for a particular process in order to optimize uh, the uh, the gases. Okay, um, I got a question on what is your normal repair for leaks on steam tube rotaries? Okay, uh, the steam tube rotary, and uh, we. We didn't put the best picture in the world. We should have included a picture of one with a standard steam chest. Mm -hmm. uh, on a standard steam chest, and the white one has uh, that style. I don't know if you can, can uh, the the one down below. This one on the left? Yeah, can you enlarge that picture? Actually, here, let's just do yeah. this. Let's just enlarge this live here. Okay. You see on the end of that dryer, very, there's some plates, uh, and um, get that there. There we go. okay, okay. So if there's a steam leak in that dryer, um, the one that had the bunch of tubes we, is is one that we don't we don't manufacture uh, that often in that configuration. But uh, normally you're going to have a steam manifold, and it's going to have these cover plates on the front of it. Okay, there you go. Um, right there, you're going to have these. These are hand hold covers, and there's a hole. This um, this plenum is about a foot thick, and there's a tube sheet in here that the tubes are rolled into. So if you have a tube leak on that dryer, you can pull that hand hold cover off there, and you can actually plug that tube, and and you can go back run until you have the time when there's an outage. 
uh, and um, and then you can reach through there and actually cut the end off that tube and and collapse it the ring out and pull a, a single tube out uh, and they go out from the opposite end and then they push back through and and that can be rolled through that handhold cover there mm. that has a plate on the back side out with a gasket so that this part is an ASME code vessel that's built for the pressure of the steam uh, so it would it would be um, it would be easy to on that particular unit to block that tube off okay um, the other unit that we showed it would be a little bit more difficult you'd have to go in and cut that tube and put a plug in it so let's see that's a good question very good question let's see let's see have you seen more rolling than welding on these types of seals? On, on the tubes, mm -hmm. I'm assuming on the tubes. Mm -hmm. uh, we do probably 60% rolled tubes and uh, um, about maybe, you know, somewhere around that 60 to 60, 60 40. Uh, we do, if the customer wants, we will, uh, our tube sheet on our, our units are double grooved uh, so that you bring the tube in and, um, and you roll it and flare it, and so it's you've changed the shape of that tube and flattened it out and uh, imparted it into that uh, that tube sheet. If uh, if requested, uh, we'd be glad to roll it, and then we would weld it to the tube sheet, uh, and then we'd re-roll it. Uh, okay. That that just makes um, that that makes for a really good seal. Uh, years down the road, when you go to change it out, it makes it a little bit more complex to to get the tube out and uh, um, and and change tubes um, related to the steam tubes so uh, I think you've touched on it a little bit what what's the main heat transfer mode with well, heat heat transfer mode for a steam tube dryer is both conductive and radiant uh, what we're doing uh, we're not bringing hot air into that unit we're bringing steam and that's a rotating tube and shell heat exchanger so those for those who are not familiar with the steam tube dryer we have uh, each one of those panels that we showed there on that front end represents a tube that runs from one end of that dryer to the other, typically four inch OD or four and a half inch OD. Uh, they are part of the ASME uh, 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 vessel, and uh, we are we're bringing steam in there. Say 150 pound steam that's going to be at uh, 367 degrees, and it's going to have a latent heat of about 860 BTUs. So what we do, uh, that's on that's on a slope, uh, and the steam injection is brought in by a Kate Johnson rotary steam joint, uh, and as the steam condenses, the condensate comes back down to this end. It goes into a, uh, a sump, and then is siphoned back out through that steam joint. Uh, so your steam is carrying the load, uh, the heat transfer. That is uh, that is used is the latent heat of condensation of that steam, and the method of transfer would be radiant and conductive. Mm. It's an indirect heat dryer. Okay, well, we got a very practical question over here. Um, how do you uh, increase feed into a direct heat dryer? How do you increase the feed? Increasing increasing the rate of production through a direct heat dryer is done by um, one of two methods. Uh, either you increase the temperature of the gas coming through the dryer or you increase the amount of hot gas coming into the dryer. If you're running as hot as the material will allow you to do that, then you have to increase the gas coming in. If you do that, you also increase the velocity. So there is some terminal velocity or maximum allowable velocity where you're going to start to pull out larger and or larger and larger particles. If you want to pull out like a 200 mesh and you're running it at a velocity of 400 feet per minute, you go to 500 feet per minute, maybe you pull out your your, your 50 mesh material. Then you go to seven or 800 feet per minute through that dryer, maybe you start pulling out some quarter inch material. So mm. it's a matter of how much material, how fast the air can go through the dryer uh, without sweeping out uh, material that is a product. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to go back to that question slide. Okay. Um, last round on questions. If you guys have any questions, um, I think I think we're we're almost done. 
So um, if you guys have any additional questions or if you want to just send an email on the questions, uh, you can email it to our customer sales rep, Amber, or you can email it directly to me, especially on the technical types of questions. Um, my uh, email is tzhang, T-Z-H-A-N-G, at optimusps.com. Um, other than that, we are social. Optimus is social. Um, we got. We will be uploading the webinar onto our uh, Optimus Process Solutions YouTube channel. We are on Twitter. We are on LinkedIn. We have our website, obviously. But uh, overall, fantastic discussion, mm -hmm. Hank. Okay. Um, we have some great questions, and we are looking forward to seeing you guys again. Well, thank thank you. you for having me.